Hello, class. I am back and uh, we've sort of finished up coordinate systems now and that's really finishing up chapter two. Um, there's a lot more in a, uh, along the lines of what I said in the lectures uh, in your book covers all of that. We're, we're very parallel in the first two chapters as to how we cover the material. Um, <clears throat> that's not probably the case from now on entirely, except for chapter eight, of course. <clears throat> uh, so let me uh, um, mention a couple things. I'm not going to go into chapter three, which is the vector calculus right now. You got a taste of vector calculus in lecture one when I discussed Maxwell's equations and the epiphany to James Cook Maxwell of, oh my God, uh, light is an electromagnetic uh, wave phenomenon, uh, as well as uh, not just light, but all electromagnetic uh, waves were that. So yeah, it made it a lot easier to, uh, to, to really figure it all out. Now, the chapter after chapter three is chapter four, uh, electrostatics. And I cut, well, actually, yeah. And I, and, and starts with Maxwell's equations, stuff like that. I'm gonna come back to Maxwell's equations. What I wanna do is I wanna go through uh, what I would consider sort of an, a standard electrostatics uh, curricula. So that you can look at a, a couple different applications. This is more applications oriented electrostatics, uh, but, um, I want to get some fundamentals, some things that seem to, if we just go into math, 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 and you don't understand the concepts of what's really going on, I, uh, well, you know, what, what, where does that take you? So what I want is I want to give you a conceptual understanding really of electric fields and electrostatics. And uh, uh, we're going to look at three different things. Uh, and, and this is really the beginning of our um, course in electromagnetics, I guess. Really up to here, it was just uh, getting the bricks ready. Uh, so electrostatics is sort of, <laughs> I, yeah, not a good S there and, uh, or a line, but that's what we're going to be talking about today. And we're going to start with point charges. And I want to uh, uh, sort of uh, introduce you to this. Um, with looking at a, uh, a, let's say that I had a uranium uh, nucleus, right? And of course, the uranium nucleus uh, has uh, 92 protons, doesn't it? So 92 protons, now they're mixed in with neutrons and, uh, you know, God, how many neutrons are there? There's a uh, hundred and, 43, something like that, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of neutrons in there. Let's not worry about the neutrons though because the neutrons are neutrally, are, you know, charged neutral. So we're just really worrying about this. So let's say that we somehow in stripped all the electrons away from, from this nucleus that we've got here. And then we've got an, uh, an electron that is zooming by this nucleus. Now this nucleus, you know, if you wanna think about it, how, how small is a nucleus? It's about 10 to the minus 15, isn't it? So it's about 100,000 times smaller. In other words, uh, if we were thinking about an, about an atom, uh, this atom, right? Then the nucleus would be, about the size of a marble if the atom were the size of Fenway Park. All right, does everyone, everyone see that? Everyone understand that now? So yeah, uh, actually it would be a bit bigger than Fenway Park, maybe the Astrodome. So it'd be like a marble in the Astrodome, the nucleus of an atom. Now you're probably thinking to, my, to yourself right now, well, why is there so much space between the outside electron orbitals in an atom and the nucleus of an atom, which is the size of a marble in the astrodome? 
You're probably thinking, wondering that. It doesn't have to be that way. I know you're thinking, what, what does he mean by that? Well, think of a white dwarf star. Think of a white dwarf star. What is a white dwarf, white dwarf star? You know, if, if we look at a white dwarf star, which is only about twice as large as the Earth, right? A white dwarf is only about twice as large as the Earth, and yet it's got the same mass as the Sun. Now, what is the density? That is 12,000 times the density of lead. The density of a white dwarf star is 12,000 times the density. Actually, I think it was platinum is what it was compared to. 12,000 times the density of platinum. And you think, well, how could that happen? Well, what's happened is actually the uh, atoms themselves have been crushed down to, you know, uh, quarks zooming around. Anyway, not going to get into that. That's not what this class is about. But I'm saying that, and, and uh, I'm also uh, uh, saying my, my paper's too small to draw this, but this is really small, right? 10 to the minus 15. But I'm saying that this electron is going by at the speed of light, right? That's my velocity is the speed of light. And it's average distance, I'll write average because, you know, it's sort of going to, it's going to be deflected by that, but it's average distance over about a, uh, let's say a, a, a 40 uh, angstrom, you know, distance around the atom. An atom is about an angstrom, right? 1.5 angstroms for, for uh, steel <clears throat> or for iron, I mean, but if we look at that, about 40 angstroms, let's say it's zooming by, and we're going to say the average distance there is about 20 uh, angstroms, right? And you're all saying right now, maybe, what's an angstrom? But I think most of you know that an angstrom is a scientific uh, unit of distance that's 20 times 10 to the... Uh, well, this in this case, minus 10 meters, right? We could also say that that is uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 9 meters, or we could say that it is equal to 2 nanometers, right? So this really equals 4 nanometers down here. Still, this thing here, of course, I've drawn it super large, but, uh, you know, it's really, really, really small. So small that if I just dotted my thing, it, it would be larger than that. So, obviously, I had to draw it large. <clears throat> so, it's 92 protons, right? And we've got an electron going by at the speed of light, and it's average distance away for 40 nanometers as it goes by is going to be uh, roughly about 20 angstroms or about 2 nanometers uh, away. Now, what's the force that is going to be on that? Let's not worry about the force. And that's what I want you to, to take away from this. Let's not worry about the force. Let's worry about the electric field of the uranium atom, right? Let's worry about the electric field of the uranium atom. And so that would be 92 protons and each one of those protons is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, right? There you go, divided by four pi epsilon. Now, what would uh, epsilon sub r uh, be there? What would epsilon be? Well, this is the vacuum of uh, area. This is between the marble and all the rest of the spectators in the stadium, right? So that's nothing. It's the, that, that's uh, the vacuum. That's, the, free, that's uh, the permittivity of free space. And then uh, times the distance away that that's going to be over that period of time, 20 angstrom. So that'd be two times 10 to the minus nine meters squared. 
All right, does everybody see that? That is what the um, thing is. And you know, if I wanted to put a, uh, a unit vector on the end of this, because that is a vector, isn't it? Right. It would be, uh, I should probably even just uh, erase that for a second. Oh, just large enough, maybe. I don't know. That would just be R hat because it's in a radial direction, isn't it? This thing is radiating its charge in all directions. So it'd be in a radial direction. All right. So if I throw that all into my calculator, I end up getting 33. 0.13 times 10 to the 9 volts per meter. Now, how many newtons per coulomb would I get? <laughs> well, of course, it would be 33.13 times 10 to the 9 newtons per coulomb too, wouldn't it? Because newtons per coulomb and volts per meter are the same thing. I, I really want to drive that, uh, you know, through your head. So, uh, so you've got the electric field for this. That's all we need. Now it doesn't matter if a proton's going by, an electron's going by. You know, when you think about this uh, electron, it's going by and it's going by at the speed of light uh, and it's only going to be going by for about 40 angstroms. And we sort of want to see what type of force is being placed on, uh, on this electron that's zooming past. So what, what is the force, the electromagnetic force? So the electromagnetic force is just going to be the electric field times the charge. And the charge here is just the uh, charge on the electron, isn't it? So the force would be on my electric field here, 33.13 times 10 to the 9 volts per meter. Right? Or you could have put newtons per coulomb in there times minus 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, right? Get down there. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's working better on manual focus, that's for sure. All right, so uh, can we yeah, okay, so the force then is 5.3 times 10 to the minus 9 newtons. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, that's not a very big 5.3 <laughs> nano newtons. Not a very big uh, force, but when you think about it, it's on a very small mass object, isn't it? So if we look at the acceleration, because excel force equals mass times acceleration, or acceleration equals force divided by mass, that's just going to be our mass, 5.3 times 10 to the minus 9 newtons, divided by, and this would be, of course, the mass in the uh, radial direction. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to put the minus sign there, didn't I? Because that minus sign had to go all the way through. So let's face it, it's a, it's, a, it's a force in the minus direction. So the magnitude of that force divided by the mass of an electron, which would be 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, is actually huge. Because look at the differential between minus 9 and minus 31. <laughs> That's a difference of 22 orders of magnitude. 22 orders of magnitude. Now I'm trying to think of something that would have a thrust to mass ratio of 22 orders of magnitude. Uh, God, I, I can't think of anything. But obviously, uh, here with electrons, we can do that because they're very small little objects. Now, that gives us an acceleration of 
times 10 to the 21 meters per second squared, right? I'm saying, well, that's a pretty hefty acceleration, and yet the electron can handle that. The electron can handle that type of acceleration. Now, what I was wondering about is as that electron is passing by this, now, you know, you're probably thinking, well, how long does it take for the electron going the speed of light to go 40 uh, uh, angstroms or four nanometers by this uh, small but very charged uh, uranium nucleus? How long would it, would it take it to go there? Well, you know, uh, distance equals velocity times time, right? So I'm assuming that in this direction, right, which is uh, perpendicular to the radial direction, if it's traveling in that direction there, it's not gonna really be affected as far as that goes in the 40, nan 40 nanometers. So I'm thinking that uh, if we look at that distance and that time, we could say that the time it takes is going to be that distance, that 40 uh, angstroms or four nanometers, divided by 300 times 10 to the six meters per second, right? Because that's how fast the speed of light is. And that tells us that uh, it's gonna, it, it's only gonna be flying by there and being affected by that for about 1.33 times 10 to the minus 17 seconds. Now, I forgot to change that into minus uh, 18. So really, it should be uh, 1.3, oh, oh God. did I screw that up? <laughs> Just, oh, <I> <laughs> uh, well, okay. So it's gonna be 13.3 times 10 to the minus 18 seconds. Now that's a very short period of time, isn't it, right? So uh, for a very short period of time, this is gonna be affected by this and it's gonna be accelerating on average. And so, you know, since we said that was an average, I'll say that this acceleration is sort of an average acceleration over that 13.3 times 10 to the minus to the attoseconds. That's what it would be, 13.3 uh, attoseconds. So uh, how far is that actually going to move? That's what I wanted to know. I wanted to know how is this going to influence this, right? We've got an electron and it's going by and it's gonna be attracted. I think everybody can see this is a negative charge. That's a, a, a positive charge. So if we wanted to uh, keep all of these, this would be negative, this would be R, R, there you go. Oops, I didn't even need those around there then. There you go, all of this would be R, so that we keep the unit vector and the direction of the vector is always constant. So, if it's, uh, this, this is what I wanted to see. I wanted to see how much this is going to deflect, right? As it goes, this 40, uh, things. Let's just bring that 40 up there, bring this up to the very beginning of when it's going to actually be acting on it. And what is this distance? What's the difference in the distance between here and here? Right? What, what is that distance? Well, we know that we're accelerating in this direction. We had no, we had no acceleration <clears throat> in the negative y, uh, y direction at all, <coughs> did we? So. Uh, now we are. And what we can do is we can use the distance equation, S equals S0 plus V0T plus one half AT squared to figure out how far off that actually is. And that's what I'm gonna do right here. So what is that distance in the negative Y direction <clears throat> that we're off. Well, there was no original, there was no uh, original velocity in the y direction. 
in the negative y direction. So it's just going to be one half, right, times the acceleration, which is minus 5.8 times 10 to the 21 meters per second times the time that it was actually affected uh, by that uh, nucleus, which would be 13.3 times 10 to the minus 18, 13.3 times 10 to the minus 18 seconds, right? And that tells us how far it's going to be deflected. And I, what I get for that is 1.26 times 10 to the minus 12 meters, right? So it's not going to be deflected very much at all compared to the four nanometers that it's going over. In fact, it's only gonna be deflected by about one one thousandth of a nanometer, right? Over that thing. But it's still gonna be deflected and that's what I wanted you to see is that uh, the, uh, we figure out the electric field. The first thing we do is figure out the electric field. Then we use the electric field because there's so many ways to get electric fields, isn't there? That's right. So we use the electric field then to figure out the force, just like we did with that much simpler electric field in the electron gun configuration that we looked at earlier. All right. I actually believe I did put my timer. No, oh! no, I'm kidding. I did put it on this time and we still have time left. <clears throat> and I figure we do because it seems like I takes me about just as long to go through that uh, thing as, as I need to. Now uh, I want to look at another multiple charge electric field. And I want to not only look at electric statics and I, uh, uh, you know, electric field for a, for a point charge. It's hard to write up at the top. <laughs> That's my disclaimer because it's a you can't see it, but it's all bowed up here. Get down there. All right, and then I uh, we are also going to look at multiple point charges. I also think I have to get a new Sharpie, but I bought 20 of them uh, for like a dollar. So, oh, okay, maybe not a dollar, maybe $10, but I've got another one here and I've got a whole, uh, and that one looks a little bit better. So, uh, <clears throat> let's get back to this. Multiple point charges. Here's uh the layout for our multiple point charges. I'm going to put four point charges around in a square. Three of them are going to be positive point charges. One, two, three, four. Uh, what was this one? That's a negative point charge. And then this one here is a positive point charge, right? They're all separated by one meter. I mean the corners. The corners are separated by uh, one meter. So Right? No, it's not that good either. They're all, they say they're fine point. There's a, these are not fine point. All right. Uh, oh, maybe the other end is the fine point end. <laughs> no, no, that's not right. Uh, it is on that blue one there. These uh, these cheap Sharpies, so they don't give you anything. Okay, well, anyway, I'll, I'll try this one. We'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, it doesn't look too good. So with those point charges, what we've got is superposition. So that is, oh yes, that, that actually is pretty good. So what we do is we figure out the individual contribution to wherever we want uh, inside there. And I'm gonna say that these individual charges that we have here are going to be 10 picocoulomb charges, 10 picocoulomb charges, all of them. 
So this charge, this, 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 you're probably thinking, well, how many electrons would make up a 10 pico Coulomb charge? And the answer is a lot. <laughs> We, we could actually do it here. I'll, t uh, I'll tell you what I've got. Pico, you're, Pico is so small, right? You're thinking, oh, Pico, my God, that's 10 to the minus 12. So if I have a 10 Pico Coulomb charge, and I divide that by the charge on a electron, that tells me that I would have somewhere around 60 million electrons. Uh, 10 picocoulombs equals about 60 million electrons. Something like that. And, and I've got four of them. Now, uh, I want to find out what the electric field is, as a first iteration anyway, right in the middle. Now, is there anything there? No. No, there's nothing there. There's just four point charges, right? There's four point charges. There's, there's nothing in the middle right there. We are just like we did this. Remember how we used the uranium nucleus and we found out what its electric field was first? And then we used the fact that it had an electric field at, at such and such a distance that that would cause a force. Same thing here. Same thing we're going to do here, but we're going to do it for each one of those. And I'm going to give each one a number. This is going to be one. This is two. This is three. And this one is four. All right. So each one of those has a number. We're going to look at the separate contributions that those play on that point in space. On that point in space, this point right here, right? There's nothing there, nothing. It's a vacuum of space. The only things that exist in this universe are these four point charges right now. What we're trying to find out is what the instantaneous electric field is at that location exactly in between these four point charges. So let's do that. So let's look at the contribution from a, a, a point one. That's gonna be that positive charge, isn't it? So the contribution from that positive charge is going to be it, right? Um, in fact, let's, find, let's just find the magnitude of that, of that positive charge right now. Let's just do that. Right, for, for, for uh, number one, at that distance. In fact, I'll write it out generally right now. So let's say Q1, which would be this positive 10 picocoulomb charge, divided by 4 pi epsilon r squared. Right? Isn't that what it is? Let's throw some numbers in there. 10 picocoulombs divided by, stay ahead of me, 4 pi times 8.85 .8 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter, right? And then what is R? Like I said, stay ahead of me. Everybody probably already figured out what R is. What's the distance from here to here? Well, we know the distance from here to here is a meter, right? So wouldn't the distance halfway be 0.5 meters? And, and, and over here too, wouldn't the halfway point right here, wouldn't that be 0.5 meters? You know, what is 0.5 squared plus 0.5 squared taken to the square root? It'd be 0.5 taken to the square root, wouldn't it? 
what is the square root of 0.5? And I, I, everyone knows it's 0 0.7071. 0 0.7071. Seven one meters squared, right? So that's the equation that I have right there, and that's really what I would call. I'm going to call that the magnitude of the contribution from E one, but that's not uh, E one, is it? It's just the magnitude. That's all I figured out right here. And in fact, I I I, I believe I have an answer. Oh, actually, no, I did it all symbolically. <laughs> so no, I don't have an answer for that, but don't worry about it because uh, it's all gonna fall out uh, in the end anyway. Uh, let's just use this one right here for a second. So let's look at, now we know what the uh, magnitude of this is, right? So let's not worry about that yet. I could come up with a magnitude right now, but, um, uh, why don't we work it out symbolically, and we know that this equals this. All right, so let's, let's just do it. So what's my contribution from E1, though? Now, how do I know? I mean, this thing in the middle, there, I, I don't have two charges. This is what students always say to me. Professor Grenquist, I don't have two charges, so I don't know if it's being pushed away or being pulled to uh, uh, number one. Is it being, is this thing, because there's nothing there, is it being attracted or is it being repulsed? Some of you now already know the answer to that question and some of you don't. Here's the answer to the question. Let's think about this for a second, right? Didn't I say that the, um, Electric field is really just the, the force field divided by Q, right? You know, it's, it's uh, Newtons per Coulomb, isn't it? Newtons per Coulomb. Newtons per one. Coulomb. Newtons per one Coulomb. Newtons per plus one <laughs> Coulomb. I can't say it any other way. And I know, I know people are still going to get this wrong on the test. It's plus one Coulomb. So here's what you say. Here's what you say to yourself. I'm going to put a one. I mean, it's, you're not really putting a one Coulomb thing there, are you? You're just mentally, virtually putting a one Coulomb charge there so that you can figure out the electric field because it's one Coulomb and it's plus one. <clears throat> so uh, I don't know how to make that uh, any more emphatic than I just did there. But yes, it's pushing it away, isn't it? It's pushing it away. So what I find here is the electric field for number one is pushing, just for number one now, is pushing down and to the right. That's the electric field for number one, isn't it? It's pushing down and to the right. And so, what we can do is we can take this magnitude. I should actually come up with a number for that magnitude. Uh, you know, but I, I, yeah, okay. Uh, look, I'll do that because I'm going to be using that over and over and over again. And uh, let me just see what type of time we've got. Uh, yeah, I've got enough time to, to give you uh, that. And that is about it. Okay. 10 picocoulombs divided by 4 divided by pi divided by 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 divided by 0 0.7071 squared equals 0 0.180. Zero, right? 
with lines over the top because it was really 0.1798. Uh, three. So I actually should have made it nine, nine, one, seven, nine, nine. Well, I'm not going to do that. It's one, it's 0.18. All right. Now, volts per meter or Newtons per Coulomb, either one, Newtons per Coulomb, volts per meter, the exact same thing. So anyway, that's what we've got right now. Let's just look at this now. So E1, the contribution at that location from E1, E1 is going to be uh, 0.18 volts per meter times the cosine of 45 degrees, right? Because it's going, it's going positive x. Oh, I got a little thing. Of, oh, I wonder if that even works. Positive x, did that? No, that doesn't even show up. Okay, well, that's why. Uh, positive x, negative y, right? Positive x, negative y. So let's do that. Uh, 0.18 volts per meter times cosine of 45 degrees i hat minus 0.18 volts per meter times the sine of 45 degrees j hat. Does everyone see what I did there? I just used that 45 degree angle there. And I said that the cosine is in that, in that direction is positive. And the, the sine going down, I don't know why I'm motioning. There's nobody that can see me except me. And the sine is uh, uh, the other 45 degrees is going down. All right. So that's my x direction that's my y direction i think you can see what e2 is going to be e2 right that is also pushing down but now it's pushing down in this direction right which would be negative x negative y 0.18 volts per meter oh my minus uh, cosine 45 i hat uh, minus 0.18 volts per meter sine 45 j hat e3 let's look right over there that's going to be pushing up right this was one that was two this one is going to be pushing up this way so it's going to be negative x positive y negative 0.18 volts per meter cosine 45 i hat uh, plus 0.18 volts per meter sine 45 j hat and then the last one e4 that's the strange one isn't it because e4 now is going to be attracting it so this is four, but it's also two, right? Because this is pulling it down this way. So it's going to be negative x, negative y again. So E4 equals negative uh, 0.18 volts per meter i hat. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Cosine 45 degrees. I'm running out of room. i hat uh, minus 0.18 volts per meter sine 45 degrees j hat. Does everyone see that? Okay. Uh, the total is all four of those. This one, this uh, lecture has gone on a little bit too long maybe. I hope I, I, I can get it up there. So let's just see. I've got plus, minus, minus, minus. So that gives me two of those minuses. So that'd be minus 0.36 volts per meter uh, cosine 45 degrees uh, i hat. And then uh, in the j direction, I've got minus, minus, plus, minus. So, uh, wait a minus minus plus 
minus right. So I have minus 0.36 sine 45 degrees, right? Volts per meter. So that's what my total is. I'd have to multiply those out, but I think I'm running out of time. I'll let you guys do that. Cosine of 45 degrees is 0.7071, by the way. Uh, okay. 